Anybody glad you got up this morning? Hey, I know it was, I know, yeah, amen. I know it's one of those mornings where um, it's, uh, it's a little overcast, maybe a little rainy, it's a little cooler, first full week back in school. It's like, it's been a perfect morning, morning to stay in bed, right? Um, but you're here, and um, I know God has something he wants to speak to you about. I'm sure he's probably already been stirring in your heart, um, but I want to encourage you to take out your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Um, and so uh, if you use the Bible app on your phone, uh, you can use that as well. Uh, we preload, if you go under events and hit the Grove Church, we preload all of uh, the scripture and the notes and everything in there, so you can definitely take advantage of that um, as well. But I want to encourage you, take out your Bible one way or another. If you don't have a copy um, of the Bible, uh, download that app um, or uh, on our connection wall right outside uh, the room here. We'd love for you to take a Bible uh, for free because uh, we want you to be engaging with God's Word. So uh, just be plugged in this morning. We're, uh, we're in uh, the third week. Uh, the teaching focus that uh, we're calling third party, and I'll kind of talk about what that's about um, in just a minute. But um, you, uh, you probably might not pay a lot of attention to uh, the way that, that contracts have become a big part of our culture today. Um, I remember like, growing up hearing my dad talk about how there's nothing more valuable than an honest man's handshake. And I, and I remember my dad talking about that growing up, and, and, and he always taught me, he's like, there's a firm handshake, like you can tell a lot about a man by his handshake, right? And, um, and he would say, you know, whatever you do with your life, look somebody in the eyes when you talk to them, shake their hand firmly, and when you give them your word, let that be your word. And that was great wisdom, good advice. I watched my dad model that, you know, as best as he, as he could growing up. But we live in a culture today where that's not always true, right? Um, the words that we, that we get from other people, um, they don't always play out to match up with, you know, what they say. The actions don't always match up. And, and we run into this with business dealings or just w with people, any Comcast subscribers in the room. I don't mean to pick on Comcast, but, you know, it's like they seem to be kind of the worst about at times of like, here's what you're going to get. And then and it's, you get in the middle of it and it's like you get your bill. It's like double the price. And you're like, whoa, what happened? Actually, I got on the phone with Comcast last week because our, I always dread it. Like anytime we have Comcast here with the church, and that's a running joke Donna and I have is like, who's going to endure the Comcast call when we have to do that? But I got on the phone uh, this last week with Comcast because our rate was about to, I thought it was about to go up. And so I was prepared. Like I had found another internet provider. Like I was just ready to like lay it out and be like, I'm really happy with my service, but I'm so happy I'm going to walk out the door if I don't get to keep my rate. And that's just kind of how I roll with that kind of stuff. So, so I called them and I was like, hey, I know I'm getting to the, getting to the end of the term and my rate's going to go up. I'd really like to stay here, but I'm already researching other options. Um, so, and, and they were like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Let us look at your account. And they pulled it up. And I will not believe this. I actually had a good call with Comcast. And they said, they said, um, they said well, I've got good news. Your rate is actually locked in for six more months. I was like, no way. Comcast is not going to take more of my money. And they were like, yeah, this is good news for you. And I was like, well, yeah, great. So I actually had a good conversation about commitment with Comcast. It was great. I was like, hey, I'm on board for the next six months. Sounds good. Um, so, but you say, well, why are you talking about all that? Well, in our culture today, um, commitment is something that just doesn't seem to mean what it used to. And because of that, that's why we have to contract everything. We have to get everything written out. We, we can't trust anybody. We've got to read all the fine print. And we've got to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on. I mean, you just look at our culture today. I mean, people enter into marriages with prenuptial agreements, basically saying, I know this isn't going to work out at some point, so here's how things are going to go down when it doesn't work out, right? Um, and, and we look at sports athletes. Like, a lot of athletes now, they sign non-guaranteed contracts. Like, what's up with that, you know? Um, and, then, and then we look at, you know, people will give us their word about something until they decide to give their word to somebody else about the same thing, until it works out better for them. We live in a culture where we will say things from behind the screen of our phones um, that we would never say in person. We turn on the news now thinking that somebody's going to commit to telling us the truth when really all we're getting is, is their opinion and, and their bias toward a certain situation. So it kind of brings us to this place of um, how do we live? How do we live in this culture today when um, it's hard to understand what's really commitment, what's really truth, and what's not? And then how do we as a church live and follow Jesus in the midst of that? And so it's kind of what we've been talking about through this third party is that Jesus showed up in this kind of polarizing culture, really. Um, it was a heavy political culture that was, had, had different views on things. 
And then he showed up in the middle of a religious culture also that had taken some of the Old Testament law and said, well, here's how you should really live it. And so, And you have some people who just didn't want anything to do with it. But then so you have Jesus showing up in the middle of kind of cultural and political unrest, which is much like what we live in today, and says, here's how I want you to live. I want you to follow me, and this is what it looks like to live in your culture. So we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and Jesus saying, I've kind of got like this third party. It's not this one or this one, but it's here, and I want you to walk in this with me. And Jesus says something to his disciples later on, right, right before um, he was arrested. In John 17, he says, says this to them. Um, he says, I do not ask, he's praying to his Father in heaven. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you, that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So in other words, Jesus, his expectation for us as his church is not that we would disappear from the world. Um, it's not that we give our lives to Jesus and then he's going to zap us out of here. His, his plan was actually to leave us here and for us to realize, look, you cannot change culture in and of yourself. But what you can do is you can choose how you're going to live in the midst of culture. And so he lays out for his disciples, like, you're going to have to deal with this. You're going to, have to, you're going to have to see my perspective on these things and realize that it might be different than how other people see them. And I'm calling you to live in this. And specifically, the passages we're going to look at this morning, Jesus challenges us with the area of commitment. And I think his message to the disciples could kind of be summed up like this. And I think this is kind of his message that he would challenge us with this morning through these texts is this. It's that we have to consider... Your, we have to consider our commitments before you change course. Consider your commitments before you change course. Because you're always going to be tempted to maybe change a commitment. And I think Jesus wrestles with and unpacks underneath these scriptures. We're going to look at a few different areas of our life where commitment is important. And, um, and he challenges us to, to slow down, consider the commitment that you've already made before you change your course before you change your direction. Well, why is commitment important? Well, the good news, hopefully, that I can give you this morning is, is just to remind us about the commitment that Jesus Christ made for us. It was unconditional. It was not something that you and I deserved. But he left heaven, came, lived, walked, breathed as a human on this earth, lived the life that you and I could never live, went to the cross and died the death that you and I should have died, resurrected and defeated that so that you and I could be brought back into relationship with God. And that's the message of the gospel. And Jesus remained committed to that calling, to that purpose, even when culture, even when circumstances says, like, I'm going to, we don't want your message. Even when you and I, as we looked at last week, would declare to God that we were enemies toward him, that, that's when he demonstrated his love toward us. His commitment pushed through the circumstances. And so that matters because you and I are the beneficiaries of that. We get to walk in that. So we understand that first and foremost, our commitment is to Jesus, the one who has already committed himself to us. That's where our commitment begins. So it starts there, but then we understand that we have commitments to each other. As we live, work, and play, as you go about your life, we have commitments that we've made to other people in our life. It begins with God. It ripples out into other relationships. And it's important for us to really consider those commitments and to think about what those mean, especially faced with the opportunity to make a change or to make a move in a different direction. And God really just wants us to, to pay attention to those things before we make quick decisions. So we're going to unpack this morning um, a few areas. Um, some of these are they're a little heavy this morning, and um, they may not be directly related to you and where you're at in your life. But I want to challenge you to take the principles that come out of these and apply them to where you are. Because I, I would say that in a room with, you get enough people in a room together, there's probably some of us here this morning that are struggling with some commitments. Maybe it's a commitment to your spouse. Maybe it's a commitment that you've made to your kids. Maybe it's, maybe it's a commitment just in life in general. Maybe it's your commitment, your relationship that you have with Jesus. Commitments sometimes start to wane. We get a little tired. Life creeps up on us. And we have to step back and we have to consider those commitments and 
Not be quick to make a change, but to reflect back on those commitments and let God lead us forward and show us what that looks like. Because I believe this morning God wants to reignite a passion for the commitments that are in your life. Philippians 1.6, I love what Paul says here. He reminds us, he says, and I'm sure of this, that he being God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God's not going to give up on you. So my challenge to you this morning is don't give up on the commitment that you've made to him. He will strengthen you. He will bring you through whatever season it is that you're going through. But just consider your commitment before you make a change. So let's unpack this this morning. And we're going to jump in now to the Sermon on the Mount um, where we see Jesus challenging us in a few different areas on commitment. We're going to pick up in chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus says this, and as we saw last week, he starts out by saying, uh, he almost talks about the elephant in the room. He says, you've heard that it was said, so he's saying, this is how you've interpreted it, this is how you've heard it, but I'm going to give you clarity on what it means. So here's, here's how it goes, verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Consider your commitment before you change direction. I'm going to look at a few thoughts underneath that, that big idea this morning. Here's the first one is that our thoughts really do matter. Your thoughts really do matter. How many of you in the room, when your spouse or somebody in your life comes up to you and they say, I've been meaning to talk about you, I have an idea. How many of you get super excited when your spouse comes to you with an idea? It's like, uh, I don't see any hands going up. Because, well, why is that? It's like, well, some of you maybe love it, but it's like your spouse comes to you and it's like, I've been meaning to talk to you about something. I've been thinking. Now, where does your mind go, like, automatically? It's like you start running through all these questions in your head, right? I mean, you start thinking, like, what have I done, right? That's usually where we go first. It's like, what have I done? What am I doing that I'm not paying attention to, that I'm about to get called out on, and this is not going to end good? I'm going to be sleeping on the couch. What have I done, right? Like, so your mind just starts going everywhere with that. It's like, what have I done? Or if it's not what have I done, it's what are you about to say that I'm not going to like, and then we're going to have an awkward conversation, right? Maybe you go there. And your, your head starts running through that. Or if, if, if this, usually where my mind goes is, how much is this going to cost, right? Like, it's like, I got an idea. I'm like, oh, great. Like, we got this, this, and this. I haven't even heard the idea yet. And I'm like, nope, can't afford it. Not going to do it. And, and so our minds, they run in so many diref- different directions just because somebody says, like, I've got an idea. I've got a thought. Well, why is that? Why do we do that? Because we know behind a thought is probably... And an action that somebody is hoping that they can take, right? So it's not so much the thought that makes us nervous. It's the action that's going to come from the thought. So we get a little paranoid. We get a little nervous. And so we think through this from that perspective, and we start to realize that wow, thoughts really do matter. Because behind every action, there's, there's a previous thought that's pushing that into reality. And, and so we get nervous. And I think that's kind of what Jesus is wanting us to understand in this text as he starts to talk about lust and adultery, and really what he's stepping into is a conversation on sexuality here. And, and Jesus is saying, look, I want you to understand that your thoughts really matter, but because, because thoughts precede the actions, and if you're going to understand the commitments that you have in your life, you're going to have to slow down and think about what you're thinking about, because it really does matter. Now, in our culture today, as we all know, Sexual issues are constantly in front of us. So whether we're talking about gender identity or we're talking about um, same-sex marriage or we're talking about transgenderism or whatever it may be that we're talking about when it comes to the, the hot-button topics of, of sexuality, they're, they're in front of us, right? And, and we've got to be wrestling with, with what's Jesus' perspective on that and how do we navigate through those with grace and truth. And, and, and I don't have time to jump into all those this morning. I really, really want to just kind of focus in on the exact context that Jesus is talking about here. In this, in this text, which is adultery, and it's, it's the mind, and it's our lust. Because our thoughts do matter. But here's the challenge that I want to give to us, because I, I, I see this happen within the church in general. Is that when it comes, especially to this issue of sexuality, 
We can be so quick to condemn and judge those who may be struggling with a sexual sin that you don't struggle with, all the while ignoring the ones that we do struggle with within the church. You see, I think it's easy when you don't struggle with a particular sin to look at somebody and call that sexual sin sin, all the while ignoring the very same one that you're wrestling with in your own life. And so I think when it comes to this issue of sexuality, we get it all wrong when we start compartmentalizing and saying, yeah, this is probably wrong, but that's probably okay. And, and we start picking and choosing. It's like, no, we got to holistically discuss this topic. And so that's really what Jesus is getting at here is he says, ah, you've, you've heard about the action. I want to talk about the heart for a minute. I want to drill in and I want you to go back and think about first and foremost your commitment that you've made to me to honor me with your life. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here to his disciples. So as he starts to unpack this, this um, topic on sexuality, we, we find out that he's specifically really talking about something that, that 2,000 years ago you wonder, oh, did they really struggle with this? And obviously they did. But we fast forward in our culture today, and it's, this is such a big issue that's in front of us now, is just the mental side of struggling with sexuality. Specifically, um, this shows up in our culture in the realm of pornography. And I want to share with you some statistics, because I think Jesus was talking about pornography without talking about pornography. Uh, I don't know if the term existed then, but I just want to share with you some alarming stats. And it's easy to look at these and ignore them or just want to focus on some other sexual issue. But Jesus is calling us to look at this. And he says in, in 2016, this is crazy. In 2016, people watched 4.6 billion, not million, billion hours of pornography at just one website. That's crazy. It's the biggest porn site in the world. 4.6 billion hours. That's 524,000 years of pornography. That's a lot. 61% of pornography, this is how our culture is shifting, 61% of pornography is now viewed on a mobile phone. And you say, well, those sinful people, they ought to clean up their eyes, right? Yeah, that's, that's kind of where we jump at as the church, and, and we're just, oh, the world's got to get their act together. Well, Barna, uh, the Barna Research Group, who, who they do all types of research uh, within the church and outside of the church, says this. According to Barna, nearly two-thirds of all men view porn on a monthly basis. Get this. With the rate being basically equal among those who self-identify as Christian. Barna's research further concludes that about 35% of born-again Christians believe that sex outside of marriage is morally acceptable. 64% of youth pastors and 57% of pastors struggled with pornography currently or in the past. 54% of youth pastors who are currently struggling with pornography live in constant fear of being caught. Church, it is so easy for us to look at our culture today and say, oh wow, culture's jacked up, culture's messed up, but I think if we're honest, we need to let God examine our hearts within the church as well. Because if we're going to see the culture redeemed for the glory of Jesus, it's going to begin as God purifies his church and calls us to be who he's called us to be. Our thoughts really do matter. And, and so we look at this text, and, and Jesus is like, you got to control your thoughts. Like, your thoughts actually really do matter about everything. I think we take this and we follow the teachings throughout the Bible, and it's not just sexual issues, but it's everywhere. Our thoughts really do matter. We're told to, to take every thought captive, to not let just words flip out of our mouth of, as if they don't matter because it reveals our heart. So there's a challenge here this morning for us to really let God work on us from the inside out as we sing this morning. Now, I hear sometimes we'll say, well, well God, doesn't, doesn't God just want me to be happy? Like, God created me to have a sexual desire. Isn't that like God's fault? Like God's not looking to squash your attraction to the opposite sex. But what God is wanting you to do is to fulfill that in the ways that he's deemed appropriate and healthy and beneficial. So as he starts unpacking this text... Our temptation here is to look at this and just want to attack the behavior 
And it's good to take steps to prevent the behavior. There's nothing wrong with that. But we've got to be careful to make sure that whether it's this issue or any other issue in our life, that we come back to our commitment that we have before God in a relationship with him, knowing his grace, knowing his truth, knowing his forgiveness that's there. And we have to make sure that as we navigate through this, we don't just band-aid things, but we actually let him work on our hearts. So, yes, take steps. Parents, you ought to have full access to your kid's cell phone, to their social media, to know what's going on. We have that responsibility as parents. As spouses, we ought to be open and transparent, not hiding anything. Text conversations, phone conversations, emails, whatever it may be. We live in the open in front of each other because we should have nothing to hide. We should welcome that accountability into our life because we need that, but... But here's the deal. There's a deeper, deeper heart issue that's underneath all that. We can't just modify the behavior. We've got to let God speak into us and where we are. And so that's what Jesus then elaborates on. He says, look, the, the mental side of this really matters. Your thoughts matter. So because of that, you've got to seek to continually surrender and repent to me. And that's what he talks about. Jesus uses some pretty crazy language. And he says, look, if your eyes causing you to sin, gouge it out. Sounds like intense, right? You're like, does Jesus really mean that? No, he doesn't literally mean gouge out your eye. But he's using extreme exaggeration to draw um, extreme attention to something that really matters. And that is dealing with the struggles that's going on in your life. The things that keep you from being fully committed to God and, and fully committed to the people in your lives. You've got you've to let God deal with those things. And there's this continual dying to self so that I may die and Christ may live through me. That happens. It's not just a, I got saved, I got dunked, I got baptized, whatever, and I'm good. I'm moving forward, I'm going to heaven. It's like God's called us to live for so much more. So we have to consider that commitment before we change course of direction. Jesus lays out some steps in this for us to think about um, how we navigate through this. Uh, and, and so he kind of gives us three, three steps here in the midst of this. As he says, your right hand and your right eye. In Jesus' culture, the use of the word, of the right side of the body, was deemed as the dominant, powerful, um, most needed side of the body. So Jesus is drawing a point here, and he's saying, look, even if it's your right side of your body, and that's what's causing you to sin, nothing can matter more than me. So whatever it is, got to dig underneath the surface. Your thoughts matter. You've got to dig underneath this, this stuff. And so there's three things that get revealed here. First thing is, is that Jesus says, look, you've got to know the issue. You've got to know the issue that's impacting your commitment. He says if it's your right eye, if it's your right hand, whatever the issue is that's impacting your commitment, you've got to know it. And if you're not for sure what it is, then that needs to become your prayer, asking God to reveal that and show that what that is. So you've got to know the issue, and it's ultimately a heart issue. Don't focus on the behavior. Focus on the heart. So that's where the commitment gets interrupted is at a heart level first. So Jesus begins there, and he says, you've got to know your issue, but then you've got to attack the root. You've got to attack the root. And I think the root shows up in relationships and routines. And for those of us that, in this particular context, Jesus is saying it's about adultery and, and any, any type of sexual activity, whether mental or physical, that happens outside of the context of your marriage relationship with your husband or your wife, Jesus is calling that sin. And he's saying you've got to deal with that. And, and we look at that and say, well, well, God's created me, and, and I'm just not happy in my marriage, and God wants me to be happy. And, like, and we even take scripture out. You would not believe some of the things I've heard people say to justify about why they're doing the things that they're doing with people that are not their spouse. And I would say this. Say, yes, God wants you sexually fulfilled. God created it. He wants that to happen in your, in your life. But if you're struggling in that area of your life, the remedy is not outside of your marriage. The remedy is your marriage. So if sexually you're not feeling fulfilled in your marriage, work on your relationship with your spouse. Don't seek alternatives to fill a void that was meant by God, the creator of marriage, to fulfill in your life. That's part of attacking the root. Is working on our relationship with each other. We get so busy, we get so caught up in life, we don't make time for each other. Work on that relationship. But then he drills down and he says, um, another thing is, is relationships, but it's also rhythm. It's 
it's rhythm, it's routines. You, you continually stick your hand in the fire, guess what? Eventually, <laughs> you're going to get burned, right? We tell our kids that all the time, right? It's like, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And they're like, eh. don't touch the stove, it's hot. Eh. And then what do they do? They touch the stove, and you're like, I told you it's hot. And then they're crying for 30 minutes. It's like, why did you just listen? I think that's kind of what God does with us. He's like, you keep sticking your hand in the fire, you're going to get burned. So we, we know the issue, we attack the root, but then we pursue the answer. And the answer is Jesus. And, and Paul says in Colossians 3, 2, he says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So when we lock in and we're focused on Jesus and our pursuit is Jesus, even in our marriage, Jesus is the win. It's not my selfishness. It's not my satisfaction. It's the glory of Jesus in whatever context I'm in. So in my marriage, in my uh, being single, waiting on God to bring the person to me, my pursuit is Jesus. And when I'm locked in on the glory of Jesus, I'm less concerned about the glory of myself. And that's what he calls us to consider our commitment before you change course. Because the issue may not be your spouse or the fact that God is not bringing you your spouse quick enough. The issue may be the fact that we have lost sight of our commitment first and foremost to Jesus Christ. That's what he calls us to remember. So we move on and Jesus then steps into a conversation about marriage specifically. Consider your commitment before you change course. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Jesus says this. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And I'll explain kind of what that means in just a moment. Verse 32. But I say, Jesus says, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So in this context, Jesus, again, is reminding us, consider your commitment before you make a change. Specifically talking about marriage, and, and what we have to understand here is that the moment to give up, the moment to throw in the towel, will always present itself. It's kind of the next point we look at underneath this. The moment to give up, the moment to throw in the towel, will always present itself. And, and, and sometimes it's good to quit. It's sometimes it's good to throw in the towel in certain scenarios of life. It, it's okay to throw in the towel last Last Sunday, we had a, a, a big gathering for our, our Grove kids, and then the Grove students showed up. And um, at, the, at the end of the day, um, we had our Grove students show up, and they were, um, we had this massive mudslide that was going, uh, it was probably 100 feet long. At the bottom was this huge mud hill. We had a blast. Um, this is just a one little short picture or, or small picture. It had a few people in it. But, um, but these guys, um, in, at about 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, started going down. These, these are big boys. Some of these played football. Some of these were on the wrestling team at Halls. We see the Halls wrestling coach Shannon is on here. He was the ringleader and all this. And, and, and so it's like I was doing it with the kids. And I was like, hey, this is good. This is fun. And then the big boys came out. And I was like, I'm not a very big boy. And, and they literally started like mud wrestling down the slip and slide, like uh, tipping over each other. And they get to the bottom, it's like throwing each other down in the mud. And, and I just, I felt like it was, it was a calling from God for me to walk away <laughs> and to not go down that slip and slide anymore. So I just decided that I was going to go. I went over to stand by my wife and she was like, you're nasty, get away from me. And so, so I just, I went and, and I went and stood beside somebody that was new to our church. I was like, hey, that'd be great. Make a good impression there. And I was like, I'm not going down that path because it's just not smart. And, and, and all that to say, sometimes in life, it's okay to walk away for your safety. You walk, you walk away, right? Some things we don't have to worry. I mean, uh, country, any country music fans in here? Um, Kenny Rogers wrote a song called The Gambler, right? And he even said something like this in the song. Go ahead. See, go ahead and sing it. You gotta, uh, I'm not going to sing. You can sing it. Okay, so see, even Kenny Rogers gives you permission. Sometimes you need to run. There's nothing wrong with it. But here's the deal. Jesus comes along and he starts talking about marriage. And in marriage, this is one of those areas where Jesus really says you need to stick in there. You need to be committed in this. Now, I know this is, this is a sensitive issue. And I want to try to walk through this carefully, but yet honestly from Scripture, okay? Because I know there's so many variables in the room and uh, and so many of us have been impacted in marriage in different ways, and you've went through different things. So it's a difficult topic to talk through. I want to spend just a few minutes 
talking about this because I do want to challenge you to consider your commitment before you change course because what was happening in Jesus' culture is that the Sanhedrin, who were this group of uh, religious council leaders who would look over the law and say, this is how you're supposed to live it out. And they would come before the people and say, okay, here's what it really means to follow God. And, and there, was, there was a couple of specific leaders in this council that were saying, just give your wife a certificate of divorce. If you're not happy, then you're obviously meant to be happy. Just divorce your wife and go marry somebody else. And that's how they were interpreting Moses as saying, of give your wife a certificate of divorce and move on. So it kind of sounds like our culture today, right? Um, in some ways. And so Jesus shows up and he's like, uh-uh, that's not how this is supposed to work. Let me bring you back. Let's talk about commitment for a minute. When divorce is permissible. What the focus, I don't think so much as Jesus' heart, is when is divorce permissible, but it's about what is his design for marriage to endure and to move forward. So Jesus speaks a little more, um, he elaborates a little bit more on this in Matthew 9, 3, 19, uh, 3 through 9. I'm just going to read this really quick. This is the Pharisees. This is another religious group like the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees come up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So that's where that was coming from because that's what they've been taught. And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, let me say a few things here about this. First of all, um, marriage, God is the orchestrator and creator of marriage. He lays out the terms by which the marriage dynamic is supposed to work. Um, it is a husband and a wife, a male and a female, coming together in the context of marriage. That is God's design. That is God's plan for marriage. And in this culture today, I think that's something that we, we, we're sensitive to the fact that most of culture does not view marriage in that way. But we understand that marriage is, that is God's design. And when that happens, it is a process of two becoming one, meaning sexually, spiritually, emotionally, all the way around, two become one flesh. And when God puts those two together, his desire and his plan is, the, the, is that those two remain together. That's his, that's his plan. But in the midst of two becoming one, those two are, are imperfect people. We're all broken and messed up. So that is what can make marriage beautiful. But that's also what can make marriage tough and difficult in the midst of that. And so Jesus says, look, I realize that there's imperfect, sinful people who come together in marriage, which is all of us. And he says, sometimes people make bad decisions in marriage. And so he says that there, you are permitted to divorce because of sexual unfaithfulness. So he gives permission for that. But in the context of that, knowing the heart of God, even when something is permissible, doesn't mean that it's preferred, if that makes sense. God desires that marriage continue on and, and move forward. Sometimes, after hard work, and it's just not able to happen. Now, when divorce happens, I think there's some things that we should think about and, and consider as we walk through this is that divorce, whether permitted biblically or, or not, divorce is painful for everyone. Many of you in this room have maybe ever either went through a divorce or your parents were divorced, and you know that the, the pain and the hurt that that brings on everyone. So regardless, it's painful, and it hurts. And I've counseled with couples, and, and just I, I know the hurt is there. That's, that's why I encourage couples to exhaust every option. Consider your commitment before you change course. Work through every option before you decide to change course and direction. And, and I think it's, it's wise for us then to be careful in how we counsel people. Because it's easy, and I've seen this happen too, where somebody goes through one experience and then 
they project that experience onto somebody else who's struggling, assuming that the dynamics that were in their relationship are the same that's in someone else's relationship. And I say that there's wisdom that we can learn from each other, but we must be careful and cautious in how we counsel each other. And we should always be pointing people to seek the glory of Jesus in the marriage. Now, I will say at the same time, when we get to that point where divorce happens, I want you to know that God's grace is sufficient. Divorce is not an unforgivable sin, as some would paint it out to be, that if that happens and God will never love you, use you, bless you, don't believe those lies. They're straight from the pit of hell. But we should be wise as we walk and navigate through our relationships. To consider the commitment before we change course. I think Jesus was just speaking into a group of people who were so quick to just throw in the towel. Now you say, well, what about abuse? What about when there's abuse in a marriage relationship? The Bible doesn't specifically say anything about abuse specifically in a marriage. Here's what I would say to you. If you're in an abusive marriage or dating relationship, don't stay silent. We want you to know that this is a church where you could come and, and whether it's with me or one of our other staff members or whatever it is, don't stay silent. One of the worst things you could do if you know of, of someone who's in an abusive relationship, whether that's mental, physical, or emotional, whatever it is, it's all abuse. I read a story about a woman who was counseled once by her church and people within the church to go home and just submit to her abusive husband because that's what the will of God is, is for her to submit. She went on and told about how that was so destructive to her and her kids. I would say God does not expect you to submit to abuse. But he doesn't want you to stay silent either. Because I think that's the role of the church, to come alongside and help you consider, first and foremost, your commitment to God and his desire for your life. Marriage is a difficult thing as we navigate through that. So those of you that are not married yet, here's the advice that I would say. Learn from those of us that are a little bit farther along. When nobody has marriage figured out, right? If I come across somebody that's been married for 50, 60 years, I'm like, can I buy you coffee? Like, I want to just know. Like, I love my wife, but like, to, be, to make it 60 years in this culture, like, that's amazing. We've been married 13 years, and I, I was with somebody a couple weeks ago, and they were like, wow, that's, that's crazy. Most couples don't. I was like, I, I could name, unfortunately, too many friends that haven't even made it five years. Marriage is hard work. None of us have it perfectly figured out. If you're thinking about getting married, go through good premarital counseling before you get married well in advance of your wedding so you can start working through issues because we all have issues. and We bring those into our marriage. Consider your commitment before you change course. Jesus wants us to step back and look at all of our relationships because life will get stressful. Life will challenge who we are. Your spouse will fail you. They will disappoint you. And they will do it more than once. And seek the glory of Jesus more than the glory of your spouse. Let God walk you through that. And I'll end with this. Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Jesus kind of speaks a little more in generalities here. Switching from the thoughts to the moment to quit. And now verse 33, he says, And again, you've heard it said of those of old, you shall, not, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no, Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So here Jesus shifts from the topic of, of sexuality and marriage to just commitments that we make. And again, he's still reminding us that we have to consider our commitments before we change course. So he's saying to us here, really, I think what he's saying is know your limits and say no. Know your limits and say no. Some of us have a yes problem. Everything that comes our way, it's yes, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. When everything inside of you and everybody around you who loves and cares for you is saying, no, you can't say yes again, but you say yes. And a lot of times, I get it, you do it with good intentions, right? Because you just want to be everything to everybody. We talked about that last week. You can't be everything to everybody, but you can be some things to some people. So you've got to be you 
And you've got to let God lead you into where you need to say yes and where you need to say no. And I think that's at the heart of what Jesus is saying here is, is consider your commitments before you change course. Before you say yes again and you swear and promise that this time you're going to follow through, step back and consider the commitments that are already there. That way your yes can be yes and your no can be no. Because every time that we say yes to something else, what that sets us up for is then not having the bandwidth to follow through on a commitment that we've already made. So we say yes to one thing, and that actually sometimes automatically ends up turning what used to be a yes towards something else into a no. And Jesus is saying, I want you to walk carefully. I want you to consider your commitment before you change course, before you change direction. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 2.10. He reminds us that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God has good things that he wants you to say yes to. And God's prepared those in advance, and he wants you to walk in them. But if we say yes to too many things, we may not actually be able to say yes to the few things that God really wants us to pour our life into. And then the story of our life becomes, I'm busy, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I feel like I never have enough time for anything. Oh, I'd love to be able to do this. I'd love to be able to do that. God doesn't want you to live in the fantasy land of what you could do. He wants you to be able to walk in his will and walk in the plans that he has so that you can experience what he has for you. So that you can say yes and it be a confident yes. So this morning, I want you to just begin to think for a moment about what is that commitment in my life? Where God's maybe challenging me to, to think back about that commitment. To realize God's goodness. And as our team comes up to lead us in, a, in just a moment of response, I, I want you to just begin to let God speak into your heart. If you would just bow your heads just for a moment.